And if you brought a Bible, John chapter 10, as we prepare to study God's word for a few moments. And if you don't own a Bible, by the way, there's Bibles on the tables. You can pick one up. You can also pick up a reading guide as Luke was talking about. That's really our, our heart. It's for you to get to know God one day at a time in your own Bible. I uh, came to Christ in the middle of a snowstorm and a drug deal in 1997. And in 2000, uh, someone challenged me to read through the Bible in one year. And I'm like, dude, I, I know how to catch a football. I don't really like to read a whole lot. And, uh, but I got in an ice tub for 15 minutes after practice, starting in, in uh, 2001, excuse me, 2001, in Las Vegas, Nevada, during training camp for the XFL, this wild, it was like WWF meets the NFL as a wild league. And it began a rhythm in our life that, if I'm really honest, changed everything. I, I began to understand who God is, not for what I learned from maybe my parents or grandparents. I actually started learning right from his word. Um, as, a, as a husband, I was a, I was a new husband. So started learning what it looks like to be a godly husband. We, we had twins with, within a year and a half of getting married. So, hello, like, dude, I need some help. help. Where are my parents at? Like, you guys, want, you guys want the best book on parenting? The Bible, go to Proverbs actually. Proverbs 22, 15, it says, foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction will drive it far from them. How many know the rod of discipline in your life? <laughs> Yep. We have a phrase we say a lot that we learned from the Bible. When you're raising kids, tons of love, tons of discipline, and then consistency throughout. It's just a fantastic formula right from God's word. And so it changed everything. And so that's our heart. We just simply want you to get to know God one day at a time in your own Bible. We're working through the Bible in four years. We're in the book of John. Everybody say, John. Uh, the Holy Spirit wrote this book. It's an account of the life of Christ through John, one of Jesus' inner circle, one of his 12 disciples. He's actually in his inner, inner, inner circle. There was James, John, and Peter. And John not only wrote this book, but he wrote three other little letters called 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John. And then guess what? He wrote the last book in your Bible. It's actually called The Revelation of Jesus Christ. So John was exiled to an island called Patmos, and there he got this revelation and he wrote this down. And so, man, we're gonna get to that next year. The, the book of Revelation is wild, and it's end time events. And when you see what's going on in the world right now, and then you compare it to Revelation, you're like, dude, Jesus can come back at any time. So, man, get ready. Someone say, get ready. And get ready for real because he could come back at any time. This world is chaotic, but I love that we, we can have deep peace in our heart no matter what's going on in this life. We got solid scripture. The Bible never changes. God never changes. In a wild world, we just want to continue to go back to it. So, um, by the way, first time guest, can you just wave at me one more time? I want to make sure they're in the back. Thank you for being with us. Wait, right here. Come on, first time guest right there? Okay, over here, anybody? First time, okay, question, first time you as well. I, I, I'm gonna ask this question, you already, I know, already, already know you're gonna say yes. Chipotle. Okay, on a, on a rating from one to 10, what would you say? Like 10 being, I love Chipotle, it's amazing. Five being, it's, it's all right. What's that? Cadoba, you just lost it, bro. That stinks. Are you first-time guest? Are you really? Chipotle, where's it at? Ten out to Matt. Okay, come on. What's your name, dude? Caden. Everybody, say what's up, Caden. Okay, and what did you prefer? Because I, I need to get that for you next week. Cadoba. Where my? Okay, let's do a quick little poll. Chipotle, raise your hand. Cadoba, Cadoba, raise your hand. Cadoba. I, I can go back and forth. So what's your name, dude? Michael? All right, we're gonna get Michael a Quidoba. Matt, can we make sure we get that? Because I, thanks for being playing along, dude. That, that was good, you're a good, good, good sport. 
I made the conversion. I'll tell you why. And maybe I can convert you, Michael. Is uh, they, they whipped out this new deal called um, brisket. Is it brisket? Where, how many even know about that? See, they, they took away chicken pastor, and I was like, I was going into the full depression. And then all of a sudden, they brought out this brisket. It's unbelievable. So I don't know why I just told you all that. You're like, dude, I only have a limited amount of time. I came to church for the word of God. Who many came for the word of God, man? You just, raise your hand. You're ready, you're ready to go. You're like, shut up and get to the word. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Let's get in. Let's pray. Let's get in. Lord, what a privilege, truly, truly, what a privilege and honor it is for us as Bible teachers to read along with this amazing church family. And then we're really asking you, what do you want to speak to your people? And so today, it's an honor and a privilege. So I pray, God, that you would get me out of the equation. I just want to humble myself. Your spirit would combine with the scriptures and you'd speak to souls right here in this auditorium. Everyone tuning in all over the world. We don't just want to go through a religious routine, just go to church. We want to hear from heaven and we believe you're going to speak. So again, get me out of the way. Speak to your people. Encourage us, challenge us for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, what leader have you been following lately? What leader have you been following lately? I will tell you, the fruit of your life is connected to who you follow. Today's world, you could follow all kinds of different influencers, different leaders. Uh, growing up, I was thinking about this, and I, I was thinking of how true it is for my personal life when I was young. I remember I followed my parents. And how many grateful for good parents, by the way? Just amazing parents. I had great example of generosity, of love. I remember every Christmas we'd find a family that was maybe struggling a little bit, and we'd go on a little mission trip on Christmas Eve and go bless people. And, and I just saw, I mean, we didn't have a whole lot, but what, what we had, my parents just loved to give away. That was one of the amazing things that I saw out of these leaders. And um, I remember, golly, growing up, just like some of you guys, you're young people, you're here, you don't want to be here, but you have to be here. And there was a pastor on stage, and you began to follow what the pastor said. Then I grew up a little bit, and uh, the number one influence in my life became my friends. Anybody, anybody remember that? Maybe that's still your season. And I'll be honest, I had some friends that I followed that got me into all kinds of trouble. And there were some friends. I, I learned some good stuff from some of the friends. And then I started thinking, man, you know who the ultimate leader many times in our life is? <laughs> My feelings. It's so wild. Isn't it wild? Like, I just, I was, the other day, in my schedule, it said lower body workout. And if I'm honest with you, I'm like, I don't feel like it. I mean, yeah, curls for the girls maybe, but like squatting and like leg, like no one likes leg day except, well, maybe some people, but, and, and I was like, you know what, who's leading my life today? Not my feelings. I don't care how I feel. I'm just going to show up anyway. And I put my earphones in and NF was on and it was the song grinding. Yeah, everybody know NF? And I texted it to my boys and I was like, hey, here's the difference between successful people and non-successful people. Successful people... They go, I'm going to grind by the grace of God whether I feel like it or not. And I'm going to follow Jesus. I'm not going to follow my own flimsy feelings. I'm going to go full sin, and I'm going to follow him no matter what I feel. And it got me thinking of this teaching. And I was like, man, when I've been studying this along with you in John chapter 10, Jesus compares and contrasts two different leaders that people are following. Number one, he was talking about himself. And he, and he called himself the good shepherd. Everybody say good shepherd. And he was, he was comparing with some religious leaders that were trying to lead his people and they were leading them astray. In fact, they were leading them with a ill motivation. They liked the money. They liked the popularity. 
Now Jesus comes on the set. He starts leading. People starting to follow him. And they're hating on Jesus. And so he's talking to these people in John 10 and explaining the difference between a good shepherd and, and them. You remember um, the chapter you read before John chapter 10. It was John chapter 9. You guys are biblical scholars. All right, good job. And in John 9, Jesus healed the man that was born blind. And they were all freaking out. And now in John 10, he has this conversation comparing the good shepherd with them. And it's tough for us. I don't know if there's any shepherds in the building today or online. Any shepherds? Raise your hand. You are uh, herding goats and sheep and whatnot. But then it was very common. And so he gives this illustration on leadership. And he says the leader, he talks about himself, is the good shepherd. And I lead my sheep. And by the way, you are a sheep. Anybody, you, let's just all say it, bah, like, get your, bah, just get, bah, you, you're, you, you're, you follow, you kind of wander at times, some of y'all are pretty stinky, you didn't get your shower quite yet today, and uh, we have a ten, tendency to wander, and we need a shepherd, we need a shepherd in our life, and Jesus is presenting this, and I'm just going to tell you right now, those of us in here that have seen the fruit of us leading our own life and then finally coming to the end of it and being like, I'm sick of the fruit that's coming out of my life. I'm all in with Jesus, the good shepherd. I'm gonna follow you. I'm just gonna tell you the fruit of it has radically changed my life. You can debate the Bible. You cannot debate a changed life. Now, am I perfect? Do I shine, you know, polish my halo and float around every day? My wife will tell you no, but I, she will tell you I'm a different dude. From the drug dealing, depressed dude in the car in 1997 to who I am now completely different because of who you follow. So who are you following? Who am I following? That's the question today. And we want to point out from John chapter 10, just a couple different ways that the good shepherd leads. If you're a note taker, write it down. Number one, he speaks. The question really is, are we listening? He speaks. You'll see it in John chapter 10, starting in verse 1. He says, I tell you the truth, anyone who sneaks over the wall of a sheepfold rather than going through the gate must surely be a thief and a robber. Underline that in your Bible. But the one who enters through the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him. The sheep recognize his what? His voice and come to him. He calls his own sheep by name and he leads them out. After he has gathered his own flock, he walks ahead of them, and they follow him because they know his what? They know his voice. They're listening. They won't follow a stranger. They'll run from him because they don't know his voice. Now, pause there because you need to know a little bit of the context, again, of that culture. Jesus knew full well that the Jews he was talking about would understand this. In, in a town, a lot of shepherds would keep their own sheep for overnight. So just imagine like this huge sheep pen, maybe six feet of you know, rocks and wall, walls around it. And then there was like a gatekeeper. Instead of a door, there'd be a gatekeeper. So you'd be maybe leading your sheep kind of all over, you know, in, in, out of town. And then you'd come back into town before you went to bed Say Pastor Casey's a shepherd, he would drop his, I don't know, 20, 25 sheep. I mean, you're a pretty wealthy guy, right? You'd put them in, you know, for storage for the night. And then um, what, was, what would happen many times is in the middle of the night, there would be thieves and robbers. They'd go by twos. And you'd like, I don't know, I'm looking at you for some reason. You and I would be robbing. And, we, and I, would jump, <laughs> I would jump on your shoulders and I would hop over. And I would go with my knife and I would kill about four or five sheep, throw them back over the wall, and then I would somehow wiggle back over the wall and you and I would take off while the gatekeeper was sleeping. That was the picture and many times that's how they would rob back then. Well, then in the morning when the, when the shepherd, say Casey, wanted to you know, take his sheep out of the sheep pen and go back into the, you know, make them eat some good green grass, he would come in and he would go to the, you know, the, the guy in front. He'd just start calling his sheep. Be like, yo, sheep and stuff, let's go. It's time to go out and get some grass. And because the, they knew the shepherd's voice, 
All of a sudden, out of all these different sheep, about 25 of them, they, they weren't marked or anything. They just knew the shepherd's voice. And they'd start following him as he led them out and about. What was the picture? The picture that he was presenting, he as the good shepherd, he was actually the owner of the sheep. These other false teachers, they were the thieves and the robbers that were coming to kill their sheep. So he's speaking directly at them. He's, he's saying, hey man, you guys are off. And I was just thinking, there's such a variety of voices today, aren't there? What voice are you listening to? You, we say this all the time around here. Whoever's in your ear is going to steer. It really is true. So we, we, we're super careful about what content we're consuming, who we're following. Why is that? Not out of weird religious, like, I don't know, weird stuff. It's because we truly know that whoever we listen to is going to influence the fruit and direction of our life. When I was young, growing up in church, I remember hearing God's voice, but if I was really honest with you, I would be plugging my ears, man. La, 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 I don't want to listen to you now. I was involved in something I shouldn't have been. He's like, yeah, it's probably not going to work out real good. La, 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 right? And maybe that's you here today, and, and, and something's happened in your life, and you start hearing God's voice. Don't hear it as someone that's wanting to beat you up. Hear a loving father saying, come back to the fold. Come back to the fold. One, um, one individual that follows my voice at times is my dog, Ding. Um, he's an Italian greyhound. His real name is Dash. Then we moved it to Ding, D-I-N-G. And then my wife texted me one time, and she meant to say Ding, but it came out as Dean, D-E-A-N. I gave you way too much information. My dog's name is Dean now, just so you know. <laughs> and Dean listens to my voice. You guys, you guys, you pet owners, you guys do this, like, if you, if you say something like this, like, hey, uh, hey, Dean, and fill in the blank, whatever your pet is, you want to take a walk outside? Does your dog do that too? Heck yeah, bro, where you at? Let's go. Or uh, <laughs> the other one, though, that he runs away is if we go, hey, Dean, you want to take a shower? He's like, heck no, the dude just bounces the other way. Um, <laughs> what I've noticed too is he'll listen to my voice and what I've found, like, like for example, when we're taking a walk, I don't even need a leash because when we take a walk, I'll start walking and he hears my voice and he just follows me. And it got me thinking, how many of us Christians are disconnected from his voice and he actually has a leash on? We actually need a leash Instead of hearing the voice, and, and that's what he says. He's like, he said, the sheep hear my voice, and as I move out, out and about, the sheep end up following me. And that's what a good rabbi did. A good rabbi would walk ahead, and his example would show them the way. And as they listened to his voice, they would follow. One of the keys of this church, as I mentioned, is listening. The best way to listen to God, church, is this right here. I just want to hear the voice of God. Now, yes, he speaks through the Holy Spirit. He speaks through other people. He speaks through a still small voice. He speaks all kinds of different ways. But the most solid way that you can listen to the voice of God is this. And how many, by the way, are listening to God's voice every day through the Old Testament, our secondary reading? Anybody here? Okay, just here's, I'm going to encourage you not just the primary reading in John. Right now we're in 1 Kings. I'll just give you an example of how God speaks. You guys ready? Two people, great. Okay, so I'll just tell you what he spoke to me this week, okay? I'm reading 1 Kings 17, and there's a story, and if you're not in the Word daily and you're not asking God to speak to you, sometimes you can miss this. If I grab my mechanical pencil, I put it in my eye cal, I will listen to the voice of God. I want to get to know him. Would you speak to me? And I'm reading this story of when Elijah, <laughs> when he goes to this evil king Ahab, and he, and he looks at him, he's like, hey, by the way, Ahab, God told me, um, I'm going to tell you it's not going to rain until I say so. I was like, dang, that's baller status right there. Like, you imagine just saying, it's just not going to rain until I say so. God gave him the power to do it, and 
And so after he does it, he dips down to this little brook, uh, Cherith, I think is what it was. And God told him to go to this little brook and he said, just wait there. Every morning and every night, I'm gonna send ravens to feed you. Talk about someone, that's like supernatural provision right there. I mean, Lamar Jackson and Derek Henry bringing you like Uber Eats every morning and every night. That's pretty powerful. And, but over time, because of the drought, the brook started drying up. So it was supernatural way that God was provided, but then it was supernatural how God was directing him because the brook dried up. And then God spoke to him and he said, now go to Zarephath, which means what? The refining place. So he leaves the brook. He goes to this area called Zarephath. And God tells him, when you get to town, you're going to find a widow there and she's going to feed you. So Elijah goes to her and says, hey, will you please give me a little water? She's like, yeah, sure. And he's like, hey, by the way, can I get a little piece of bread too, a little Jimmy John's or something? And she, she looks to him and she says this, hey, I'm sorry, but it's gotten so desperate that I'm about to, I have a tiny bit of flour, a tiny bit of oil. I'm gonna make one last meal for my son and I, and then we're gonna die. That's how bad it got. So Elijah looks at this woman, and he says, to, he says to her, he said, okay, that's fine, but make me a small cake first. Make me a piece first. Can you imagine, like, the audacity of the man of God to be able to go, no, make me a cake first? And I started thinking about this, and I started thinking about in desperate seasons of our life, where I say I have faith and I'm putting God first, but then I get a little desperate and now I take the wheel back to myself and it's no longer I'm God first, it's Todd first. And out of fear, I take the wheel and I start, try to make sure I lead my life. God was speaking to me this so hard and, and I was like, what is she gonna do? And she'd be like, bro, what are you talking about? We're, we're about to die and you're, and you're saying, by faith, she brings, she makes him a cake first and the Bible says miraculously because she by faith gave back to God first that the oil and the flour did not run dry until food was restored back in the area after the, the drought. And you're like, why did you just go off on that? I'm trying to give you a picture of when you listen to the voice of God every day and you need to hear something from heaven. He will speak to you if we simply open the scripture and see what he wants to say, it was so powerful, I needed to hear it. Because I don't know about you, but in, in tough times, many times out of fear, I'll just take the wheel myself. And God's kinda like, well, okay, buddy, but like, <laughs> you're gonna have to provide for everything as opposed to putting me first in all areas of your life. So he speaks, someone say he speaks. Speech. Number two, he satisfies, he satisfies, verse six. Those who heard Jesus use this illustration, they didn't understand what he meant. So he explained it to them. I tell you the truth, I am the gate for the sheep. Underline that in your Bible. You know, he's already said, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. He says, man, I am the gate for the sheep. All who came before me were thieves and robbers. But the true sheep, and he's talking about these religious leaders, but the true sheep, they did not listen to them. Yes, I am the gate. Underline that again. I am the gate. Those who come in through me will be saved. Just pause there real quick before we get to satisfy. He says he's the gate. And by the way, how many gates were there? So, so again, picture it, this, this big sheep pen. And when sometimes it wasn't in the town, but it would be out in the, kind of in the wilderness, they would have like these makeshift like sheep pens. And instead of having a door, the shepherd would actually be at the end of the, uh, he would be the gate, and so what is Jesus saying? He's saying, basically, I am the only way, sheep, for you to go in and out. I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you're a note taker, you can jot a couple more down. 1 Timothy 2, 5, I love this. Again, this is God's word. This is not Todd's word. How many ways to heaven? There's one. I didn't make it up. I didn't make the world. God did. He made it clear. He, it's not narrow, it's clear. First, First Timothy 2, 5, there's one God, 
There's one mediator between God, this perfect God, and the rest of us men. Who is the one mediator? The man, Christ Jesus, the good shepherd. Acts 4.12, another one, jot it down, so good, nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we, what? We must be saved. And I, I... have great conversations with people from different faith backgrounds and different viewpoints, and I love that. I love to have respectful conversations with people with, with genuine questions. One of my friends, he, he claims himself as a New Age Catholic Buddhist. I love it, man. I mean, that's just what he calls himself. And I, we have these great conversations, and I love it because it's like, well, what, you know, is there a bunch of different ways to get to God? And there's only one that's uniquely qualified. And we'll very clearly talk through this. Buddha's still, you know, in the ground. You, you name a bunch of other. Jesus is the only one that proved who he was. He lived the perfect life, bridged the gap. Only one uniquely qualified. They killed him. He rose from the grave proving who he is. And now he's just proving. He's like, hey, I love you so much that I didn't want to make it confusing. I wanted to make it clear. I am the gate. Anyone who comes in will be saved. Super powerful. And then, (laughs) my favorite part of the text, the second half of nine, look what it says. Those who come in through me will be saved. They will come and go freely and find good pastures. I love that about Jesus is like, He's not a headlock, he's a gentleman type guy. You go in freely, There's, you go freely in, you, f- you find good pasture. And then verse 10, which is the, the key verse of this entire church, just so you know, listen to what it says. The thief's purpose, remember he's talking about these Jewish leaders that were in it for all the wrong motivation, but also who was influencing those leaders? The enemy of our soul, Satan. So in a big perspective, it's the enemy of our soul. The thief, his purpose is to steal, to kill, and to destroy. So just pause there real quick. You've heard it said, God's got a great plan for your life. He's got a good purpose. So does the enemy. And the best way for you and I to see who we're following in this season is we just take just basic inventory. What's my life look like? Am I being stole from? Am I being robbed? Am I being destroyed? Where's my marriage at right now? Where's my relationship right now? Where's my, where, where am I at? And many times, we don't even know, it breaks my heart, we don't even know that we're under the influence of the enemy following his, his cheap tactics and his bait. <laughs> Any good fisherman, what are they gonna do? Like, I love fishing for bass. And so you put a nice big juicy worm on that hook, man, you throw it out there. What are you trying to do? You're trying to bait the hook, why? So you can... Go kill a fish and fillet that thing. It's the enemy. He came to steal, kill, and to destroy. That's his purpose. But I got good news for you. Look what Jesus says. What is his purpose? His purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. I don't know how more clear we can get. <laughs> like, like on one corner, on one end of the spectrum, humanity You can be robbed of everything in life or you can follow me, the great shepherd. And I, for many, so many years, I was trying to find satisfaction and fulfillment in everything else but God. And every time I went down that road, I was like Mick Jagger, I can't get no satisfaction. That's exactly where I was the entire time. And then in God's timing, in his grace, He opens up our eyes. Anybody grateful for the fulfillment and the satisfaction that you have in Christ? I mean, there's just deep peace. It's not based on accumulation or accomplishment. It's based on who he is. And deep in your heart, listen, you can make a million, you know, billion dollars, or you can make 10, and guess what? You can have the same fulfillment in Christ. You could have a, you know, the beautiful wife and all the, and everything, nothing wrong with all that stuff, but man, You could be bankrupt in your soul if you are not connected to Christ. It is powerful, it's key, that's exactly what it's satisfying. He satisfies, he satisfies. There was a a preacher, he said this, I jotted it down in my notes, he said, you can choose temporary pleasure and long-term pain, or you can choose temporary pain 
and long-term pleasure, the choice is yours. And I was like, man, that, that, that hit me like a ton of bricks. I've met with several people at the end of their life, and I get invited into these amazing opportunities, really a sacred trust to pray for people before they pass. And I'm just gonna tell you, I've never had one person ever say, man, I just, I regret not, ha- not working harder and having more stuff. I, in fact, I regret not doing way more drugs than I, than, I, than I wanted to. Like, there's never been a time that I've had someone regret that. But you know what I have had people regret so often? Just recently, a guy that had, you name it, whatever a man wanted, but he didn't have peace with Christ and a deep fulfillment in his soul. He said, and he, it was so cool because right like within the last, I don't know, handful of months before he passed away and, and he received Christ and he was walking with deep peace. And his only regret was, man, I wish I would have had this earlier. Reminds me of King Solomon and uh, talk about having everything. Did you guys read that in the Old Testament? King Solomon, the richest, wisest king ever to live. I mean, this dude had anything he wanted he, I mean, for entertainment, he had Beyonce over every night. He'd have like a 10-course meal. The dude like had Lambos. I mean, the dude could do whatever he wanted. And he was searching for meaning, searching for purpose, searching for satisfaction in everything but God. And it was tragic because early on, he was cool with God. And then he kind of just went off in his older years. And then he wrote this book, It's called Ecclesiastes. If you've ever wanted to study the life of Solomon towards the end of his life, read this book. And I'll just read a couple verses. I was reading these as I was studying, talking about satisfaction. Listen to what he says. It's fascinating. Fascinating. It'd be like today's Elon Musk or Bill Gates or someone like that after trying to have fulfillment in all these things. Listen to what he says. I said to myself, come on, let's let's try pleasure. This is Ecclesiastes 2 and 1. Let's look for the good things in life. But I found that this too is meaningless. And then in verse 10, this struck me. Listen to what he says. Anything I wanted, I would take. I denied myself of no pleasure. I even found great pleasure in hard work, which again, there's nothing wrong with that. God's called us to that. It's beautiful. A reward for all my labors. But as I looked at everything I had worked so hard to accomplish, it was also meaningless, like chasing the wind. There was nothing really worthwhile anywhere. Chasing the wind, pleasure, satisfaction. Jesus promised he satisfies. He's the great shepherd. Davy, King David, before he was King David, what was he? He was a shepherd. And he wrote in Psalm 23, what did he say? The Lord's my shepherd. I shall have, I have all I need. Wouldn't that, wouldn't, wouldn't that be the greatest position for a human to be in? I got all I need. Maybe that's your one homework assignment. When you wake up, say, you know what? If you're a Christian in here, I got Jesus, I'm content. I have all I need. I got all I need. Verse two, he lets lets me rest in green meadows. He leads me beside peaceful streams. Anybody need peace in your soul today? Peaceful streams. He renews my strength. Anybody feeling weak, feeling lethargic today, the strength of the Savior. He guides me along the right paths, bringing honor to his name. He's the great leader. He's the great shepherd. He guides me. You follow him, he's gonna keep you on the right path of a rich and satisfying life. So he speaks, he satisfies. Finally, number three, and maybe most important, church, write it down, he sacrifices. I'll just tell you this, any leader that you follow, look to see if they sacrifice. My parents, I was telling you about as I followed them early on, some of the most sacrificial people I know. I remember very clearly growing up where my my mom wouldn't have, this this was right after a divorce, she's working full time, going to school, and I remember I I love baseball. Any baseball players in here, I I love playing baseball. And we used to have this, you couldn't get online and order shoes. We, we had this magazine, it was called East Bay. Anybody, where are my old people at? The East Bay Magazine, it would come to our house and 
and I would always want the Nikes with the metal cleats. So you could be, it just sounded cool when you walked, it's like click, 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 you know what I'm talking about? Anybody know? So, so, and they were expensive, and my mom, you would go into her closet, she had nothing in the closet, but you know what, she, she would sacrifice for us kids, she'd always put us first. She'd be like, yeah, whatever, whatever cleats you need, Toddy, you got it. Someone say sacrifice. We're talking about a whole nother level of sacrifice in Jesus, though. In verse 11, look what he says. I am the good shepherd. There it is again. I'm the good shepherd. I'm not the bad shepherd. I'm not the overwhelming shepherd. I'm not the headlock shepherd. I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd, here it is, underline it, sacrifices his life for the sheep. It's powerful. Sacrifices his life for the sheep. The word for for in the original language is huper, which it actually looks like it, it says hyper, and it means on behalf of or instead of. What does that tell you and I? That Jesus was sacrificed, his very life sacrificed instead of me. I'm the one that deserves death. God's perfect, he's holy. I'm the one that needs to pay for my sin. Guess what? Jesus goes, you know what? I love them too much. I'm gonna take it for them. We just went to this, this um, show last night. It was called The Thorn. Highly recommend, by the way. And it's kind of like Passion of the Christ meets Cirque du Soleil, light, basically. And um, towards the end, they showed when the Romans took the cat of nine tails, it was this leather strap with pieces of, of uh, metal and pieces of glass in it. And before they crucified Jesus, they, they whipped his back 39 times, 39 lashes into the back, and it would stick into the back, and it, they would pull it back out, and ribbons of flesh would come off the back and the back legs and the back of the arms. And they showed that. In my mind, I'm like, I, I, I was tearing up, and I'm like, I deserve that. Jesus didn't do one thing wrong, but because of his love, he embraces the wrath of God on his back for you and I. Church, I'm just gonna tell you, or non-believer, that is true love right there. That is a true leader. Someone who goes first and sacrifices and takes the beating that you and I deserve. He takes it on his back. He's like, I got you, man. I got you. That's sacrifice. He says, the, the good shepherd sacrifices his life for his sheep. There's a great scripture in, later on in chapter 15 of the same book, John, John 15, 13. Jot it down, it's so good. Greater love has no one than this than to lay down one's life for his friends. That's your leader, someone who lays down their life. In verse 12, he goes on, he says, a hired hand will run when he sees a wolf coming. He'll abandon the sheep because they don't belong to him and he isn't their shepherd. And so the wolf attacks them and then scatters the flock. The hired hand runs away because he's working only for the money and doesn't really care about the sheep. And this is very clearly a jab to the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the, these religious leaders. And he's basically saying, you guys, man, I'm sacrificing for the sheep. I'm gonna lay down my life. Y'all, when you see anything get tough, you're out because you're not really in it to care for the sheep at all. You don't care. You just want to actually get the resource. Your motivation's wrong. And this is powerful. And I just want to read this. If you're a leader at this church, it's so good for us constantly. God, search my heart. What's my motivation for leading in this church? So if you're a small group leader, you're a team leader, you're a pastor, check this out. Jot it down. 1 Peter 5.2. Listen to what it says. Care for the flock that God has entrusted to you. This, is a, this gets overwhelming for me. If I'm the lead shepherd, the lead under shepherd of Jesus, and all of a sudden he sends all you sheep like rolling into love, like y'all, like, how are we gonna care for these people? Guess what? Now you, you develop other shepherds that have the same heart of Jesus to care for people, and now the church should never get bigger than four to 14 and you're in a group, and now that group leader becomes a shepherd, and we watch over it willingly, not grudgingly. And let me just say here real quick, you might be a parent, you're a shepherd. You might be a business owner, you're a shepherd. You might have six kids, you, you have starting five and a sub. 
I don't know how you did it, but guess what? That's your flock. You, you've called to care. <laughs> God's called you to care for that flock. Business, you could have 250 employees. That's your flock. We watch over it willingly, not grudgingly, not for what you'll get out of it, but because you're eager to serve God. Verse three, don't lord it over the people assigned to your care, but lead them. We don't lord, we lead by your own good example. Jesus, the great shepherd, he didn't drive the sheep, he led the sheep. Two different things by his example. And then verse four, how about this for good news if you're a leader? And when the great shepherd appears, you'll receive a crown of never-ending glory and honor. It's good news. Verse 14, 15, 16, I really don't have too much time to uh, draw attention to. He basically says, I'm the good shepherd, just as the Father knows me, I know the Father, I sacrifice my life for the sheep, talking about intimacy with God. Verse 16, he says, I have other sheep too that are not in this sheepfold. I must bring them in also. He's talking about, it's not just the Jews, but it's also the Gentiles or people that are not Jewish. There might be a, a handful of people with Jewish descent here listening and together in this room, but most of us are Gentiles, we're not Jews. And he says, guess what? I wanna bring all y'all in. It's, and it's gonna be one, one shepherd and one flock and all of us together. Paul writes this in, to the church in Galatia, verse, chapter three, verse 28. Listen to this, this is good news. There's no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male or female, for you are all what? You are all one in Christ Jesus. It's the beauty of the gospel, man. It doesn't matter what color, creed, financial status, where you live. If we're following the great shepherd, we're one big family, one big flock. That's good news. And let me just say this, by the way. If, if this particular local church isn't the best expression for you, let us know so we can help you find a different maybe pasture land under the great shepherd and other great shepherds here in our city. We wanna be able to do that. Last thing I would tell you is this. He speaks, he satisfies, he sacrifices, but the biggest question of this text that I was asking, what do we say about him? Do you know the greatest question that we'll ever ask, what have we done with Jesus? And if you look at verse 19, after he shares this with these people, when he said these things, look at verse 19. The people were again divided in their opinions about him. Does that not describe the world today? Verse 20, some said, he's demon possessed, he's out of his mind. Why listen to a man like that? And then what does 21 say? But then others said, some said this, others said this doesn't sound like a man possessed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind, which he did in chapter nine? In other words, because God loved us so much, he gave us free will. He creates man. He says, the only way I'm gonna have genuine love relationship is if I give you choice. And now I created this whole entire world to have relationship with you. I've already gone to the cross. I was buried. I rose from the grave. And I say, just follow me. You have the choice, though. To many people, there were three choices. He's either a lunatic and he's lost his mind, he's a liar and he's not the only way, or genuinely he is Lord and we get to make the choice. Amen? God, thank you for this word so clear. Thank you that you are the good shepherd that we can follow you to good pasture, satisfaction, peace, joy, forgiveness, and even now, God, as we're winding down, we pray that you would continue to speak to your people. Maybe someone in here right now that they've been trying to find fulfillment in a variety of different places, and man, they've come up short, and they've seen the fruit as they've followed other leaders. And we pray today, God, that today would be the day of humility, the day of coming to you. You say very clearly, you're not willing that any would perish, but that all would come to repentance. You're super patient with us, but now's the time, and you're reaching out your hand. I pray that you would reach your people even now, in Jesus' name. Before I say amen, I just wanna land, land the plane here just with a quick story and give you an opportunity in a moment. The band will be playing a song 
the church will be praying. If you don't absolutely have to leave, if you could just lean in and pray for these last handful of minutes. Many times in that culture, if a shepherd had a sheep who continued to wander away from the rest of the, sh- the flock, and he would, the shepherd would try to get his attention, but for whatever reason, that, that sheep was like, man, whatever, and they got distracted and they would, they would leave the flock. After a few attempts of getting the sheep's attention, the shepherd would take a rod and have to break the leg of the sheep break the leg so couldn't wander anymore but then graciously the shepherd would then take the sheep and put them on his shoulders and as he was leading the other sheep the other sheep would be following him and he'd carry the injured sheep on his shoulders speaking to the sheep and over the time as the sheep would heal he would start hearing the shepherd's voice and they would start building this this relationship this closer relationship And then by the time that that sheep was healed, he would finally put the the sheep around with the rest of the pack and begin to walk. And that sheep stayed really close. He was like like right in line, right behind the shepherd. Why do I tell you that story? Well, many times in our life, God's so gracious, many times he'll use a rod of discipline. Something happens in our life and out of love, he allows something to happen Why is he doing that? He's wanting to draw us closer to him because he's got something better. This happened recently for one of my friends that I've been praying for for almost 10 years. Really cool guy, beautiful wife, children. And he knew that God was speaking to him, drawing him, and for whatever reason, the way he calls it, he he says, I was just stiff-arming God. He was just stiff-arming God. Just giving him the Heisman. And he texted me this week and he said, he said, Pastor, I'm tired of stiff arming God. I want to start following. Will you meet with me this week and lead me to Christ? Imagine getting that text on your phone. I've been praying for 10 years. By the way, if you're praying for people right now, don't give up because they're never too late. God's, God's always on time. He'll do it in his timing. And it was wild because we met at this grocery store and I had the privilege of looking this man in the eyes as he's weeping and we're dapping up and I got to lead him to follow Jesus. And I looked at him, I said, hey man, you might have, and he's got some stuff in his life. I said, guess what though, you're forgiven. And now that healing process is one day at a time as you stay close to your savior and you begin to follow him. And I'm wondering maybe today is the day that you showed up here at church. You're like, man, I'm the, I'm the wandering sheep. And maybe you have a messed up wheel. You got something going on in your life, circumstance. Guess what? He's just calling. He's saying, just come follow me. Come follow me. I'll forgive you. I'll clean you up. I'll heal you. I'll give you my perfect life for your messed up life. And I'll lead you in on into eternity. So let's stand together. Church, just begin to pray. You absolutely don't have to go. Just pray. This is a great invitation. It's for those online as well. It is, hey man, I'm a wandering sheep. I want to humble myself before God. I'll I'll invite you to come up right here as the band plays. I'll lead you in a prayer. It's a very simple but profound prayer. It's like, God, I'm, I'm done following my own feelings. I'm done following all the wrong influences. I want to follow the good shepherd. I need forgiveness. I need your spirit to lead me. We'll connect you with some people to help you begin this journey. I promise you, man, the fruit of your life is different. Put him to the test. Say yes to him right now. So church, begin to pray. Man, go ahead and play.